everyone. Thank you, Bob Linden, Julie Meskel, and the whole team for putting on this wonderful summit this weekend. It's been really inspiring. So thank you all for being here too and spreading this message of love and compassion for all living beings. Once we leave here today, I hope we all go out into the world and share this information and inspiration with others. How many people here today consider yourselves guardians of an animal companion? Almost everyone, that's wonderful. And how many of you have your companions on a vegan diet? All right. Hopefully by the end of my talk, you'll feel equipped to take that extra plunge and try them out on a vegan diet. I grew up knowing I wanted to become a vet from a young age. I always loved animals. I was raised vegetarian by my mom. And when I went vegan in college, after reading Diet for a New America, it opened a whole new world to me as far as what I could do as a veterinarian to speak on behalf of billions of animals who need my help, not just in the individuals that I'm treating. And it, it really struck me as an ethical dilemma with regard to what we're feeding our animal companions because I don't want to have to take the life of one animal in order to feed another if I can avoid that. Dogs are biologically omnivorous, but they can thrive on a plant-based diet as long as it meets all their nutritional requirements. If a label says that it is AFCO approved, which means the American Feed Control Officials, the American Association of Feed Control Officials has given it their stamp of approval, then it meets the nutritional requirements. And that can be met through plant, mineral, and synthetic sources. So animals have requirements for nutrients, but not necessarily ingredients. So this means that if the diet is nutritionally complete, and it can be from plant, mineral, and synthetic sources, and it can meet all the needs they have to be healthy and thrive. There are also benefits from a vegan diet from a health standpoint. There are a lot of dogs who have skin allergies to meat protein, specifically chicken and beef are very common allergens. I've seen so many dogs in practice suffering from skin allergies where they're biting, chewing, licking excessively. You'll see what's called salivary staining on their feet, which is from constant licking and chewing of their feet. And this oftentimes is related to either food allergy or it can also be related to environmental allergy. But as a veterinarian, what I advise people to do, once they've ruled out flea allergy, of course, is to do an eight-week food elimination trial on a vegan diet. And this is also more economical because the prescription diets available through the veterinary prescription companies are often more expensive, and they're things like kangaroo or rabbit meat. Gee whiz, who wants to feed that to their animal? The vegan diets, by contrast, don't have any of these dead animal products in them, obviously, which many times the meat products have byproducts in them, which are a garbage can term for essentially rejects that aren't fit for human consumption. We're talking about diseased, cancerous lesions, bones, beaks, feathers, ground up, meat that would not be considered fit for human consumption. Not that anyone in this room would be eating it anyway. But this is the junk that's getting into pet food. Even sometimes rendered dogs and cats have been identified through testing of euthanasia solutions that ended up in pet foods. So by feeding them vegan food, we're avoiding all of that. We're also seeing fewer issues with food recalls. Many of you may remember some of the serious food recalls that have happened over the years and concerns surrounding melamine put in food and back in 2007 we had so many dogs and cats suffering from kidney disease because of this. Well, if they had been fed a vegan diet, that would not have even been an issue. Of course, salmonella and E. coli contamination also are concerns with meat-based foods. Another issue which we don't hear about very often is bovine spongiform encephalopathy or mad cow disease. This is something that affected the Great Britain and many people died of creutzfeldt jakob disease during this time when they were infe eating infected beef, not realizing that they were 
eating something, even though it was cooked, that it could cause an illness 10 or more years down the road. And this can affect not only humans, but our dogs and cats at home as well. They're mammals too, and they can be affected by it. There may also be benefits that we haven't yet been able to document definitively, uh, maybe risk, less risk for certain degenerative diseases, cancer, arthritis. Uh, there is still a need to study it in more depth, and there's an effort underway right now to gain funds for conducting some scientific studies on clinical trials feeding vegan diets to dogs to validate this. And I encourage you to check out power, plantpowereddogs.com to help out with that effort. Plantpowereddogs.com, that's uh, the website that will take you to the crowdfund for that. So I mentioned some of the health benefits. There are also, of course, environmental benefits. Just as we are conscious about what we're putting in our bodies for a variety of reasons, ethical, environmental health, world hunger, these reasons also apply to decisions regarding what we're feeding others. Just as those who are parents in this room, you probably are raising your kids vegan, I hope, because just for the same reasons you want to put healthy, nutritious foods that don't come from cruelty and exploitation, you don't want to cause that to be happening for feeding your offspring. And the same is true for our companions that are the, the, the furry friends we have. I have two cats at home and they're both vegans. Now a lot of people will say, well how can cats be vegan? Isn't this contradictory to their nature? Aren't they obligate carnivores? Well, yes, in nature they do hunt mice, but you won't see a cat taking down a cow or a tuna fish, even though they're fed that. So the argument that a lot of people throw out against it, saying that it's unnatural, is not actually based in fact, when you look at what's actually happening. Sure, it's not co completely natural to even have a pet at all. It's not natural to have them get veterinary attention, surgeries, vaccines, deworming. These things are things that we've done as a society to help make their lives better. And as our society evolves, as the world changes, we reevaluate things and we decide what we should do given the whole situation, not just one little aspect of it. So the way I look at it, it is if it can be done healthfully, and I'll talk more about some of the risks and issues to look out for, but if it can be done healthfully, then it should be. So even though cats are obligate carnivores, they can thrive on a plant-based diet as long as it meets their nutritional requirements. They do need taurine. Without taurine, they can suffer from blindness, cardiomyopathy, which is a heart disease. So that is important. But all of the vegan cat foods on the market, including Evolution, which has a table here at the expo, as well as Circle Compassion that just recently took over from Veggie Pet, Harbingers of a New Age, vegan pet food, have taurine added in it. It is synthetically added and even meat-based cat foods have synthetic taurine added to them. And the reason for that is the process through which the food undergoes renders the taurine unavailable. So they have to add it anyway. So apart from the basic health of the nutritional aspects of the food being adequate, it is important to monitor certain things, particularly the urinary tract and cats, since they are more carnivorous, have a more acidic body in general. And therefore, a plant-based diet makes them more alkaline. And certain cats can develop urinary crystals if the pH becomes too alkaline. So what I would suggest is to measure their pH, take them into the vet, get a urinalysis done, and see where they're at in the beginning before you switch them, ideally. And then over a couple of weeks, gradually increase the proportion of the vegan food while decreasing the proportion of the non-vegan food until they're eating a completely vegan food. At that point, a few weeks later, take them in again to have the urine tested and see what the pH is and if there are any crystals present. The types of crystals that you'd be looking for are called struvite crystals. Those form when the pH becomes too alkaline or too basic. Now, 
Just because there are crystals present doesn't necessarily mean there's cause for alarm. But if there are too many crystals, it can lead to stones. And if they develop stones, that is something we don't want to have happen. It can be requiring surgery, which is a cystotomy, to remove those bladder stones. So we want to avoid that if we possibly can. A lot of non-vegan dogs and cats get crystals and stones too, so it's not something that just affects vegan animals. In fact, there are certain breeds that are prone to stones. In dogs, the breeds are miniature schnauzers, miniature poodles, Lhasa opsos, shih tzus, and copper spaniels, who are most prone to developing struvite crystals and stones. And those dogs will end up needing surgery if they develop those stones. So regardless of what diet they're on, that can be an issue. What can we do to prevent this? Adding water to the diet is a very big part of preventing this. The more moisture in their diets, the more dilute their urine is going to be, and therefore the less concentrated the urine, so the less likely there will be crystals forming in the urine. And if there are fewer crystals, there is less chance of those crystals crystallizing into a stone. Dry food or kibble is often convenient, it's economical, so I understand why that is often the choice. And it was formally recommended for dental health, but in actuality to help with dental health, you just want to brush your animal's teeth if you can, or have them in for a professional dental cleaning, because there's plaque underneath the gum line, which is still causing disease that's going to still be there regardless of whether they're eating a wet food or a dry food diet. If you find that the wet food is too expensive or whatever, then I would just add the water to the dry food, let it sit for about 10 minutes so it soaks, makes it a nice gruel, soupy consistency, and hopefully they'll eat it right down. You can also use a water fountain for cats. Sometimes cats like that flowing water, helps them with uh, drinking more. And adding a little bit of broth to the water to flavor it can help as well. So one of the other concerns that can arise with dogs, certain breeds of dogs, if they don't have enough taurine or carnitine, which again can be supplemented, is a potential for dilated cardiomyopathy, or DCM. That's something that affects certain breeds more than others. Cocker Spaniels, Boxers, Afghan Hounds, Scottish Deer Hounds, Irish Wolfhounds, St. Bernards, and Doberman Pinchers are the breeds that are affected with that. So if you have one of those dogs, uh, you can still feed them a vegan diet, but just make sure that you add the taurine or the carnitine to make sure they have that to protect them from heart disease. I want to also address some of the common myths or complaints that arise regarding vegan diets for dogs. Sometimes people will say it's unnatural to feed this diet. Well, we have to look at the whole picture. What are we doing to this planet? What is going on with the climate right now? Are we having a severe climate disruption with global warming, severe drought, how much water does it take to produce that little bit of meat? It's astronomical, and we don't want to have to continue to support this practice that involves taking the lives of animals who are sentient beings to feed our own animals if we can do just fine without it. In the future, there may be someone who invents a cat food that's based on cloned lab meat, and that would address some of the ethical issues that arise as well. In the meantime, there is that option to feed the vegan food, and I think that it's doable. Now, there are cases where cats will be very picky eaters, and they won't want to eat it, and that can be a challenge. So it may not work for every single case. There are also maybe times when uh, they uh, lose weight because they're not eating enough. So working with them is important, and realizing they are fragile creatures in that way uh, they, they may not all make that transition, but if they're started out young and it's done gradually with patience, it often can be successful, especially if you add things like nutritional yeast to the food, helps bring out the flavor, warming it gently, adding vegetable broth. 
Some cats like seaweed. My cat, one of my cats, Betty, likes seaweed a lot, and it's a, it's a nice snack. So those are some things that you can do to help with that. Uh, another complaint or accusation that I've heard being thrown out about vegan diets for dogs and cats is that it's cruel, which is so absurd to, to say such a thing because what's cruel is what's happening to farmed animals in factory farms. What's cruel is the animals being subjected to killing and harm because they're not cared for, neglected, abused, dog fighting. I mean, that's what's cruel. So I think when people make these accusations, we need to reframe the argument and, and really call attention to the absurdity of what they're saying. It, it almost reminds me of when people say, oh, plants have feelings too. And by the way, whenever that comes up, I like to point out that by eating plants directly, we're saving a whole lot more plants. So if someone says that plants have feelings, make sure you point that out to them. <laughs> so as Bob Linden alluded to earlier, there are a lot of toxic components to the meat-based foods, the byproducts. They not only have diseased, dying, disabled animals in the food, there's also old restaurant grease, PCBs, protozoal toxins, prion contaminants. Prions are what cause mad cow disease, various uh, free radicals, and these can increase the risk for cancers and other degenerative diseases, antibiotic residues, hormone residues. So when we can feed a vegan diet and it can be a healthy way to live, I think that is, is certainly the way to go. Uh, do take time with your animals, give them the time they need to make that transition. Some may not be as inclined to eat a certain food over another, so maybe try a different brand. Uh, luckily with the dog foods, we have a whole lot of choices available. Not only do we have Evolution and the Harbingers of a New Age Veggie Pet, or now Circle Compassion who's, who's bought that, we have V-Dog, V-Dog.com, you can order a vegetarian, vegan dog kibble. Also in the stores, if you don't have access to ordering online or uh, you're trying to direct a friend to try this for their dog, if you see they're suffering from allergies, certainly. You, any pet store just about will have Natural Balance, Nature's Recipe, or Pet Guard, and those three formulas or brands do carry a vegan formula. The Pet Guard has an organic a vegan formula, in fact. So, I'm happy to take any questions if people have questions. Yes, sir. Well, I, I walked about five minutes late, so I don't know if you answered. Have they ever figured out if you feed a cat or a dog, you know, the commercial food for a year, how many animals have we killed for that? That's a good question. He's asking how many animals had to be killed for one cat, cat to be, or a dog. Or dog. Yeah, I, I haven't uh, seen exactly that number, but I imagine that, you know, if you figure for a human who's a vegan, who's saving almost 100 animals' lives a year, and just by the, you know, bo body weight of the animal, calculate how much they would be consuming, you could probably figure that out. But yeah, I mean, a lot of vegans have multiple pets. I know a lot of vegans who have multiple pets, and certainly the amount of food that they're feeding might even equal what that person is eating when you consider how many there are, so it, it does add up. Yes, you there in the, the shirt there, yeah. I have, I have two female vegan cats, pretty, pretty newly vegan, and in terms of uh, keeping their urine acidified, is there, uh, what do you recommend in terms of either products foods that you can either routinely feed your cats or you know or even if you start to see problems what do you recommend excellent question so she asked what i recommend if there's a problem with the urine being too alkaline what we can do to acidify the urine vitamin c can be used to acidify the urine however i would recommend getting the ph checked first because sometimes they don't need to have that done and if the urine is too acidic, that can also lead to problems. That could lead to calcium oxalate crystals and stones. So vitamin C is one. There's also sodium bisulfite, methionine, which is an amino acid that can be used. But 
and ammonium chloride is another one that you can ask your vet to prescribe a prescription for, but vitamin C you can get easily. Again, I wouldn't recommend checking the pH first though, just in case. Yes? So what is the pH range that you're looking for? In cats, I would suggest between five and a half to seven, roughly. Every so often you'll see a pH that's higher than that and I'm not necessarily concerned. It depends on each individual. With dogs, a little bit higher is okay, like maybe up to eight. But, and I've seen some dogs who have had pHs of nine and it kind of shocked me, so I wanted them to be more acidic. But it really varies and it, you know, it depends on the concentration of the urine too. If it's more concentrated, then that could be more of an issue with, with where the pH is. And sometimes, especially with dogs, if, if they have struvite crystals in their urine, it may suggest an infection. So I would suggest doing a urine culture or at least determining somehow if there's an infection, like if there are white blood cells in the urine test, and you definitely know there's probably an infection and certainly if there are bacteria present. And so once the infection is clear, then the pH should come back down. Yes? It went next door. <laughs> so you know they're very individual, and I know you gave some tips, but what do you tell people who really are really trying to get that older cat to transition and get them back to health? What other tips can can you give them that help them with that cat? Yeah, with the really challenging cases, there there are some flavorings that you can add that are reminiscent of the meat that can encourage them. So, you know, if you're trying to reduce suffering, which that's my role, is to reduce suffering as much as I can. I'm not obsessed with every tiny little ingredient in everything I'm affiliated with because I live in a non-vegan world. So, you know, adding some chicken or beef flavoring can make it more enticing to them. And there are some that are just not gonna make the transition, but you can do 50-50 and sometimes they'll go with that. You can kind of like mix it together, blend it, make it into a real gruel consistency. So also check with Eric Weissman of Evolution. He has a, a digest that can be added that's tasty. I just have a few minutes left, so yes. Um, the question was, what about chlorophyll for I, I think it's great. It's a great source of nutrients and phytonutrients. So I actually feed spirulina to my cats once in a while, and they eat it. Yes? She asked about chlorophyll. Yeah. Sorry. Do you feel like it's just dilated cardiomyopathy that can be caused by carnitine deficiency or also the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Because I had a dog that I fed um, vegan diet and my vet blamed me, but I looked it up and it, with, apparently it's more genetic. Yeah, my understanding is the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is, is a genetic condition that's not related to taurine or carnitine. The dilated cardiomyopathy, on the other hand, is related to taurine and carnitine. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, you in the back. So if so if you're transitioning your cats, how often do you have to check their pH? Is this going to be like ongoing for the rest of their lives? And also, are the take-home pH kits reliable? I would suggest in the beginning, the two tests, as I mentioned, if you're not able to do the first one, then still do the second one at least, and that will give you some idea. Ideally, the first one is good to have as a baseline so you know where that animal is before you switch them. But as far as ongoing maintenance, I would do it at least once a year and, and then if need be, more frequently. So I think we're about to wrap up. We'll take one last question. Yes. Um, I've been helping some dog owners that have had tumors that have come about and nobody knows where they're coming from. And I had thought possibly city water and I've been helping them with policies and sometimes we grass, things like that to try to shrink 
Have you seen a lot of this coming up? And if so, what are your thoughts about these tumors that are coming up? They grow on the outside of your skin. They're not cancerous. And how have you successfully got rid of them? Well, a lot of animals have lipomas, which are benign fatty tumors, especially when they're older. And there's a, a Chinese herbal formula that I prescribe from Jingtong Herbal that can help reduce the size of those tumors. But uh, if you want to check out veganvet.net, that's my website, and contact me, we can talk more. And my Facebook is Dr. Mays Veterinary House Calls, if you want to keep in touch with me on Facebook and on Twitter, Veg House Call Vet. So, thank you very much.